Today, I've decided to answer a question that someone has had before. You may be familiar with a prolific speedrunner in the DMC community by the name of Waifu Runs. At the time of recording this video, he holds the world records for Devil May Cry 1 any percent and 100% on normal and Dante Must Die difficulties. He has also pushed the boundaries of the Devil May Cry 3 speedrun and became the first person to complete the game in under one hour on normal difficulty. With such a storied record, it's unsurprising that he's got challenge runs under his belt as well. One such challenge run is the exact question that I'm looking to answer. Can you beat Devil May Cry 3 without using weapons? Well, on April 7th, 2022, Waifu posted a video to his channel showing that you can. We're gonna be trying to beat Devil May Cry 3. Uh, without using any weapons. I'm allowed to use Royal Guard. Um, I'm allowed to use weapons as long as it's not damaging anything. So like shooting the ice off of Sebris or using like Stinger to move faster, just for my own convenience. I'm allowed to use Devil Trigger. I can use Devil Trigger Explosions, but I'm gonna try to keep it to a minimum so I don't cheese the bosses with DTE. I can use items, but no Holy Waters. We'll see if I can beat it. We're gonna play on easy. Now, uh, here on my channel, I like to push challenges and difficulty to the absolute maximum. So here are my rules for the run. Dante Must Die difficulty, enemy surfing, royal guard, devil trigger explosion, air raid, and vortex are allowed. Devil trigger is allowed. No guns will be fired ever. Items are not allowed. And I will never damage any enemies or environmental objects with weapons. So, without further ado, let's start the party! The first mission served as a nice introduction to the challenge. It takes place in this small arena where you simply need to fight through a few waves of basic enemies. I used Royal Guard to perfect block the enemy attacks, stored up the damage, and sent it back at them with a Royal Release. Blocking attacks and damaging enemies in this way rapidly filled up my Devil Trigger gauge as well. By holding the button to enter Devil Trigger, I was able to charge up any runes past my initial three, releasing them all at once when transforming for a big burst of damage around me. This is known as a Devil Trigger Explosion, or DTE, and it is extremely useful for this run. Speaking of Devil Trigger, here we have our first Devil Triggered enemy. This is an effect unique to Dante Must Die difficulty. Not only is player damage already reduced by 50% by default on this difficulty, but when enemies devil trigger, they mitigate an additional 75% damage. One of two criteria must be met for an enemy to enter devil trigger. Either a certain amount of time must pass, or two other enemies are killed while the enemy in question is on the field. DTE helps mitigate this because it allows many enemies to be defeated simultaneously, and in theory means I would never have to deal with devil-triggered enemies. It becomes less effective later on, but for now, utilizing DTE to the best of my ability is the ideal strategy. Taunting is another way of gaining a large amount of Devil Trigger. An effective taunt will give one and a half bars of DT, and the cooldown before doing this again is only about eight seconds. Mission two had a large group of enemies, so I opted to taunt for DT and then DTE to clear out most of them at once. Royal Guard was effective against the Devil Triggered stragglers, but I didn't rely on it too much here. Before the boss of the mission, I kept one enemy alive in order to heal myself and get full Devil Trigger. Once the Hell Vanguard spawned, I wasn't feeling too confident in my Royal Guarding against her, so I simply opted to dodge her teleport attacks and taunt until I could DTE. I was able to take my time in this fight because, unlike normal enemies, bosses don't Devil Trigger. Well, except for one. Before getting into that thick shaft that causes women to shudder, I had to get through my biggest challenge yet, a spinny thing on the wall. Empty releases with Royal Guard did nothing, so I had to start the mission with the Swordmaster style equipped instead. This was so that I could toss my sword away and kick the wheel until it let me through the door. Unfortunately, there was no goddess statue where I could change my style back to Royal Guard, so I had to do the next encounter exclusively with taunts and DTE. 
there was a statue just before Cerberus, so I switched my style back to Royal Guard and I swapped out Beowulf for Nevin. Cerberus has three heads that each fulfill a unique purpose. The blue-eyed head shoots a ball of ice that is easily avoided. The red-eyed head covers the arena in ice and is a bit trickier to dodge. And finally, the yellow-eyed head, which in my opinion is the worst one, rains ice shards down upon Dante. This attack usually requires the most strategy to dodge, but in my case, I just jumped and spammed Royal Guard. My strategy for the boss fight was to stay in the safe spot, guard all of the falling ice, and then chip away at each head with Air Raid in Devil Trigger. I destroyed the red-eyed head first, followed by the yellow one. For the blue head, I got in close when Cerberus would shoot ice so that I could taunt for DT. Then I took it out just the same as the other two and headed inside. Mission 4 caused no issues until the boss, Gigapede. This thing moves around a large room shooting balls of electricity. Royal guarding its attacks was inconsistent at best, DTE dealt practically no damage, and getting hit was virtually inevitable with how long this fight threatened to go on for. I tried it all, Swordmaster to throw my sword and kick Gigapede, which dealt good damage, but it was too inconsistent when it came to actually getting the sword stuck in a wall without hitting the boss. I tried using Ultimate, a Royal Guard move, to heal when he would shoot his balls at me, but that didn't generate Royal Guard meter, and attempting to perfect guard the balls seemed nigh impossible. But what if I told you that there was a way past Gigapede that only required a single royal release and good positioning? Gigazip is tech that speedrunners use, and if they can do it, then so can I. This skip took me directly to the end of the mission, therefore completely circumventing Gigapede, and it was on to mission five. This mission started out with a required jester fight, and he was just a war of attrition. The whole fight took about 15 minutes. Depending on his attack, I would either perfect guard his balls or just hold the button and take some HP damage in exchange for guards. This wasn't really an issue because in between his attacks, I could taunt and gain enough DT in order to outheal any damage that I was taking. Once I got a full royal gauge meter, I would hit him with a release then just rinse and repeat. Ultimately, this fight was the best joke that Jester ever told. The elevator leading up to the last boss of the mission required some timing. Each set of four enemies could be defeated with three bars of DTE, so I had to be very specific about when I began charging it. If I used up too much DT, I wouldn't have enough to kill the next waves fast enough, and the elevator would fall. In a stroke of luck, however, one of the enemy sets dropped some white orbs which refilled my DT and made the rest of the ride a breeze. Agni and Rudra themselves weren't much to write home about either. Their attacks were easy to guard and DTE often hit both of them at the same time. I took them out simultaneously and pressed onward. Mission 7 introduced Hellgreed, which is an enemy capable of summoning other Hell-type enemies. But since DTE had a wide radius and was capable of instantly killing most Hell-type enemies, these spawners didn't pose much of a threat at all. For the destructible ball, I taunted in the room prior to get full DT, then I activated the switch with kicks by throwing my sword away, and I took the ball down with a vortex. I had to rely on proper positioning and hope that the ball followed me as I continued to hit it, but eventually it broke. I tried seducing this sloth into submission with my seductive pole dancing, but he had the stamina of a champ. I tried my aerial shoulder mount, side saddle Superman, and even the fabled broken doll, but none of them had an effect on this man. He left me no choice. I had to walk up next to him and give him a quick release. The vanguard that followed was even easier than the one from Mission 2. I lost a lot of health learning the Royal Guard timings for her, but she still went down without much fight, and it was time for Virgil. This was the first of three fights with Virgil throughout the game. While it was the easiest of the three, the fight was by no means a cakewalk. Virgil was deadly. 
His Judgment Cut and Rapid Slash were easy enough to guard, but his other attacks were far too punishing to challenge. After he lost some health, Virgil decided to become a Bubble Boy. This is an effect unique to Dante Must Die difficulty, where Virgil will become immune to damage and summon spinning swords around himself. These last for several seconds as he tries to attack you, before transitioning into one of several attacks centered on Dante. By itself, this new move given to Virgil wasn't too threatening, and it was the only thing he had up his sleeve in this first fight. After releases from Royal Guard and Devil Trigger Explosion, it didn't take long for Virgil to fall. After getting vored by the monster of Resident Evil 6, I was pretty much thrust right into another boss, and this fight had a lot of heart. I had to get very creative because the blue heart in this arena would steal all of my DT if left unbothered for too long. While releases from Royal Guard did zero damage if I hadn't blocked any attacks, the releases themselves would still reset the timer on the blue heart from stealing my DT. All I had to do was royal release the normal enemies in the fight and occasionally poke the blue heart. After getting enough DT and dealing enough damage to the blue heart, the main core would reveal itself and attack with sweeping lasers. I used my DT to stay in the air above the lasers and shot lightning until it retracted. From there, the rest of the fight was as simple as building up my DT and doing it all again. Much like Mission 6, Mission 9 didn't take very long. I wandered through caves for what felt like ages, and I hadn't seen another human for a while, but suddenly there was a nude female, and that was a relief. I thought she was crazy for not wearing clothes, but then I realized I was wrong about her. She wasn't crazy. She was... That shit insane! Nevin wasn't very aggressive, and her attacks were easy to dodge, so... Much like Jester, this fight was long rather than challenging. I had to constantly break her bat shield before doing damage to her, and one DTE or Royal Guard release was about as much damage as I could practically do before she summoned her bats once again. The fight did get easier towards the end because she would dismiss her bats in an attempt to grab me, so I could hit her directly and ignore her bats otherwise, but the fight as a whole still took about 27 minutes. Mission 10 saw Dante getting trapped in a room by men that demanded back shots before they would let him go. I royal guarded the saws around the room to build my gauge and then subsequently released on each guy. In the next room, I encountered the first green spider of the run. The green spiders were easier to deal with than the smaller ones, but it was also healthier and more deadly. I took it out first and then royal guarded the door to finish off the other spiders. I found out the hard way that I had to take Swordmaster at the start of Mission 11. I initially went in with Royal Guard, took out a forced hallway encounter, and entered a puzzle room. The goal was to push two statues into their respective slots, but DTE didn't do it, and neither did a release from Royal Guard. I even went to the door that locked me in and gained meter in the hopes that a more damaging release would do the trick. It did not. Alright, I would just die, run back to a previous room, to a statue, and change my st- What?! Starting the mission with Swordmaster meant that I had to do three forced encounters without Royal Guard. In other words, DTE only. I got back to the puzzle room, threw my sword to kick the statues, and triggered the next encounter. Fortunately, it was only some Soul Eaters and another Vanguard. There is a safe spot in this room where, in most instances, the Vanguard won't be able to reach you. I stood here to taunt for DT and took out each Soul Eater as they approached me. Once all of them were gone and I was back at full DT, I jumped down and faced the Vanguard legitimately. Since I took a while to heal up before jumping down to fight, she was at full health and already Devil Triggered. I had fought enough Vanguards by this point to not let that shake me, kept my composure when dodging her attacks, and took her out. The Willy Wonka elevator leading to Beowulf's Chocolate Factory only had a bunch of hells which easily fell to my DTE. There was finally a statue just before the boss where I was able to switch back to Royal Guard. Playing the part of Grendel and fighting Beowulf, I had to get a bit creative. 
For his first phase, I stood in a safe spot where he couldn't hit me, taunted for full DT, and then royal guarded his basic three hit combo. Releases to his face did by and far the most damage, so I aimed for those whenever I could. By second phase, the door was no longer safe, so I opted to move to this corner instead. He will always begin this phase by tossing cages and then charging at the player, so I royal guarded the cages, jumped over his charge, and got some distance. Anytime he would do his large area of effect punch, a cage would drop down and shoot out at me. The timing was slightly delayed compared to the cages that he would normally punch, but it didn't take too long to get their number. Phase 3 combined elements of the first two phases, so I would guard his 3 hit combo and the cages when I could, and I ran away from anything else that he tried to do. Before long, he was blind and I had a date with a time-stopping stallion. The majority of Mission 12 was a gimmick. Your health would constantly drain, but you're also granted infinite Devil Trigger. I used this to my advantage by activating Air Raid to stay safe, high above the enemies, and get them all to low health before defeating any of them. In the Vanguard room, I focused on killing it as fast as possible. The rest of the enemies Devil Triggered, but each one dropped a big health orb, so I was able to guard the doors to gain Royal Guard Meter and defeat the enemies quickly with releases. Against Phase 1 of Garion, I couldn't do anything. I just had to dodge until he broke the bridge. Once the actual fight started, I was able to tame the wild horse. And by tame, I mean I would punched it to death. Garion always circled the arena while shooting missiles before Tokyo drifting through the middle. I got on his back to avoid his fire slams, taunted for DT, and then jumped off before he disappeared. This guaranteed that he would start his drive-by attack where he would send out time bubbles and try to run Dante over. On the fifth teleport, Garion would stop in the center of the arena and do another five missile volleys. I used this time to get caught by his final time bubble, enter DT and guard his missiles and spears. Then I would hit the carriage and Garion himself with my release, thus dealing twice as much damage as I normally would. When waking up from this attack, he would spin around, but there was enough time to get on the carriage before he ran away. This ensured that he wouldn't shoot missiles while circling the arena, and then it was back to Tokyo drifting, fire stomps, teleports, and repeats. Once I got the pattern down, the fight was hardly an issue. Garion was predictable, consistent, and routine. And after a 23 minute Colosseum duel, I became a vehicle because I got that horsepower. Just as I reveled in my victory, it was out of the frying pan and into the freezer. Not long after my raw dog rodeo with a blue hell beast, I was met with the cold stare of another boss. Mission 13 marked the second of three encounters against none other than Virgil. This fight was where the difficulty really started to ramp up. For the first half, he exclusively used Beowulf. His punches and kicks were relatively predictable and therefore easy to stand and royal guard. He would still summon swords around him after a certain amount of time had passed, but this time he had another trick up his sleeve. Virgil was able to enter his own devil trigger. His transformation worked much like the players did. He gained hyper armor, faster attack speed, and most importantly, he began regenerating health. Slow and steady was no longer going to cut it. If left unchecked, Virgil would happily heal all the way back to full HP. And if he decided to summon swords while in DT, he would have free access to unmitigated healing as long as those swords lasted. It was a nightmare. He who desires but acts not breeds pestilence. You know what? You're right. Thanks, Tiny V that I keep in my pocket. I think I get it now. That will be 20 bucks. Wait, 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 what do you, what do you mean 20 bucks? I'm not free, bitch. If he was going to summon swords and devil trigger, then I would have to face it head on. Initially, I tried staying in the sky and counteracting his healing with air raid. 
thanks to Beowulf's moveset, there was pretty much nothing Virgil could do to hit me. He would swing away below me and tire himself out of DT while I kept his healing in check with lightning bolts. The problem was, this also used my DT. After every one of his devil triggers, my DT was basically sapped as well. That meant I had no leeway when it came to using DTE, reducing damage, or getting myself out of an otherwise deadly situation. But he entered DT and used summon swords far too often for me to ignore them. So that was it. I would take that power and send it right back at him. Rather than spend DT to counter his own, I started royal guarding his attacks while he was in DT, and any time he would summon swords, I would enter my DT and royal guard them too. It wasn't perfect, but being in DT ensured that any attacks I didn't guard dealt minimal damage, and the royal guard meter I gained from it was more than enough to counteract his healing. Once he got lower on health, he began weaving in Yamato combos, which were too dangerous for me to predict and guard. It was a long back and forth as he healed and I dealt slightly more damage each time, but eventually I broke through. He was so close to death that not even his bubble could save him. I used what DT I had left to finish him off with an air raid and felt more ready than ever for the challenges that still laid ahead. Why isn't this working? Nanomachine, son! They harmed in response to physical trauma. Mission 14 marked the first of three total encounters against the Fallen. These one-winged wonders are notorious for their ability to float through walls and block damage with their feathered organs. DTE, or a decently filled Royal Guard Gauge, could break their shield, but I found their attacks a bit harder to guard in this state. A perfect guard on one of their attacks would leave them vulnerable to damage momentarily, even when their shields weren't broken, so I used that time to DTE or release when I had enough juice to lay into one. If I needed health, it wasn't too hard to pace the room while taunting. After all, I wouldn't be the one falling here. As if Feathered Freaks wasn't enough, the game saw fit to pit me against a Hell Vanguard in basically the smallest arena possible. But in stark contrast to my fearful fight against the same enemy in Mission 2, this time I perfect guarded practically everything she threw at me. She didn't stand a chance. Finally, chess pieces tried to bar my way, but it was checkmate as soon as I charged up DTE. For Mission 15, I had to start out with Swordmaster so I could eventually hit the spinny thing that acted as the core puzzle of this mission. But that meant that I had to take out two Fallen exclusively with DTE, which wasn't very fun. I'm not the biggest fan of this arena when my enemy can just decide to go into the floor or out in the sky where I can't reach them. Nevertheless, I persevered and turned the dial to where I knew there was a goddess statue. Rather than switch to Royal guard at the statue, which is what I should have done, I stayed in Swordmaster for the forced encounter coming up and had to channel my inner Zeus to take out these spiders with lightning. With that taken care of, there was nothing left to bar my path. I was free to go back, collect the pieces needed to press forward, and end the mission. As I continued to climb the tower, the game kept busting my balls with its timed challenges. I thought the downstairs balls would be difficult, but they were surprisingly easy. What really gave me trouble was the upstairs ball. It required a lot of damage to break, and the time limit to accomplish this was very tight. I had to keep taunting for DT in the hallway and attempting to get lucky bounces in order to break the ball in time with Vortex. To end the mission, I had to fight the most dangerous demon yet, a woman exercising her Second Amendment right. In her first phase, Lady's bullets weren't hard to guard, and even if I missed my timings, they did minimal damage. Whenever I needed to heal, I could hide amongst the knowledge and taunt at her through the wall for DT. The second phase of the fight was when things got kinda tricky. Lady began frequently jumping onto pillars and dropping grenades. I couldn't rightly guard against those, so I opted to stay on a pillar myself where it was safer. Occasionally, her bullets were able to reach me, but 
for the most part, I just kept my distance, taunted when she would throw grenades, and whittled her down to third phase with DTE. For the last little bit, I found a nice loop where I would guard her bullets, hide from her rocket behind this pillar, and then repeat the process. She stayed stuck against the wall for the most part, and I was able to finish her off before long. Another 26 minute boss fight was in the books. Mission 17 had a long hallway where I off-screened the enemies, gained all the royal guard meter that I needed from the doors, and then made my way to the doppelganger fight. This boss was extremely predictable. The gimmick of the fight is that doppelganger can't be damaged unless he is exposed to light. In order to turn on a light, it had to be smacked open. Thankfully, seven empty releases from Royal Guard were enough to get the job done. I would do six releases on the light, then guard the Doppel's attacks until I was at full DT and Royal Guard meter. When near the wall like I was, nine times out of ten, the Doppelganger would do two dashes and then a very easy to guard uppercut. Once my meters were full, I waited until he got close one more time and used a release to turn the light on. If done right, the doppelganger would also take damage from the release, and then I hit him with a full powered DTE as well. Doing this several times was more than enough to take him down, and only a few more obstacles were left in my path. Paramount among them was literal chess, except I only had a king and my opponent was stockfish mixed with chat GPT because he was constantly cheating. Pawns were promoting halfway down the board, pieces were moving simultaneously, the king could castle an unlimited number of times from any position, and the queen kept laughing at me. By the time the dust settled, this was the state of the board. So, in this specific encounter, each type of piece fulfilled a unique role. The bishops had an area of effect heal, the rooks could summon more pieces to the field, and switch places with the king upon him taking damage, the queen would retaliate in response to other pieces taking damage, and the king had a massive health pool and was required to be defeated to end all of the madness. Oh, and the knights were there too. Keep in mind, all of these pieces are on the field at the same time, meaning as soon as two of them fell, every other piece entered Devil Trigger. Taking out every piece on this difficulty was already a feat with a full arsenal. With no weapons? Insurmountable. I know because I tried. So I was left with one course of action. Ignore every other piece, chase down the king, and deal with the healing, summoning, and every attack the board threw at me along the way. I got as much damage as I could in before the king devil triggered from time passing, and then it was a race. If I didn't keep up my damage, the bishops were able to outheal the king in his 75% damage reducing state. When I needed to heal, Staying high in the air with Air Raid meant that nothing could touch me, and the lightning kept the king at an equilibrium when he would get healed. But to make any semblance of progress, I had to get my hands dirty. Normally, when the king takes one instance of damage, he teleports away and swaps with a rook. But if you strike him while his teleport is on cooldown, he gets mad. I used an empty release to trigger his swap, and then I hit him with another empty release before he could run away again. This prompted him to do his singular attack, which happened to be a large, very damaging explosion. I entered DT before the explosion to mitigate any damage if I missed my guard, but a well-timed block would instantly fill up 50% of the royal guard gauge. It wasn't easy, and it certainly wasn't without hiccups, but I locked in and got it done. And after that experience, it was like I leveled up IRL. I started to see the strings that held the universe together, and no boss was about to stand in my way. Cerberus' second verse was the same as the first. I guarded practically everything Beowulf did this time. Oh, shit. That's the wrong, that's the wrong clip. Go to the next clip. I guarded practically everything Beowulf did this time around, and finally the twin headless got fisted. I, I, I mean, um... I, in the sense that I, I punched them a lot with royal release, and I defeated them. The penultimate mission of the game had three trials before Arkham. The first was a simple bloody brawl, nothing too extravagant. 
In the second room, I had to smash two mirrors in order to proceed. The easiest way to do this was to use Vortex in DT. And it just so happened that this room had some chandeliers that I was able to stand on. The enemies were unable to reach me, so I could taunt as much as I wanted for DT before getting back to my vandalism. The third and final room was a time trial where I had to defeat four enemies before the hourglass in the background ran out. I managed to take out the first three enemies simultaneously with DTE, and then the last one spawned shortly after. With only it to contend with, it wasn't hard to block its attacks and take it out before the timer ended. And then, it was the end of the line. Every encounter overcome. Every problem solved. Every boss defeated. All leading up to this moment right here. There was nothing left to stand in my way. All I had to do now was end it. Arkham definitely didn't skip Blue Orb Day because he had an absolutely massive health pool. If I wanted to get through this fight, I needed a damn good strategy. The Blob himself had two slow side swipe attacks and a fast vertical frontal attack. The latter one was by far the easiest to guard, so I stood in front of him and baited that attack as much as I could. When he sent out his homing tendrils, I ran to the outskirts of the arena where the tracking was weakest and jumped around to avoid them. After either a certain amount of time had passed or Arkham had taken a designated number of hits, he summoned adds. I've had people tell me that these things are slugs, but they sound and act a lot like dolphins to me, so that's what I call them. Normally, this phase of the fight exists as a nuisance, but these little creatures were actually the crux of my plan. By doing nothing more than holding a direction and walking, these dolphins became incapable of hitting me. That meant that I could freely taunt while they circled me and walk away when they began attacking. Unlimited DT meant unlimited healing, and since Arkham wouldn't come back to the field until a majority of these things were defeated, I could take as long as I wanted. I held the guard button to fill up my royal guard gauge, ensured I was healthy, and finished the dolphins off with DTE. Since I used my DT to defeat them, I couldn't use it on Arkham, but I did get a full powered release on him for every dolphin rotation. And that's how I safely defeated Arkham. Well, that's what I wished I could say at least, but reality was much harsher. Halfway through the fight, Virgil showed up to help Dante defeat Arkham. And for the rest of the fight, Virgil was controlled in tandem with Dante. Functionally, the style button became the button used to teleport Virgil close to you. That meant no more royal guard. Devil Trigger also became unusable. No healing, no DTE, no Vortex, and no Air Raid. Attacking with Virgil meant swinging or firing my weapons with Dante. Every single trick up my sleeve that I had used for the entire game was abruptly stripped away from me. I had nothing left, but the game didn't earn it. And I wasn't about to lose just before the finish line. You see, just before the fight, I equipped a gun that I knew I couldn't shoot. Kalina Ann is one of two weapons in the game that cannot be used in the air. You can press the button, but nothing will happen. So with Virgil on the field, by pressing the gun button in the air with Kalina Ann, Dante would do nothing, but Virgil would attack. I wasn't using weapons. <laughs> in fact, I wasn't doing anything at all. But Virgil was cleaning up the field. I kept to the outskirts of the arena to avoid Arkham's homing tendrils while Virgil did all of the work and I followed the same formula as phase one for the dolphins. I simply walked away when they would attack and when I normally would have taunted, instead I jumped and had Virgil cleave through the lot of them. And after teaming up to overcome a common enemy, the two brothers realized that they weren't so different after all. They reconciled their differences, opened up shop together, and lived happily ever after. But of course, nothing is ever simple, and Mission 20 existed. In order to finish this out, I had to face Virgil one last time. 
Befitting of the final boss, this was the most difficult and deadly iteration of Virgil in the game. Having lost Beowulf after our second bout, Virgil wielded the Yamato and Force Edge. In addition to his normal katana combos from the first and second fights, he also started weaving in Helmbreakers and Stingers as he swung the broadsword around. Mechanically, the fight began similarly to the Mission 13 encounter. After losing a certain amount of health, Virgil began creating summon swords on a timer. Meanwhile, on a separate timer, Virgil would intermittently enter Devil Trigger. As if his healing wasn't hard enough to deal with, when he passed another health threshold and entered his final phase, he gained another timer in which he would enter a special type of devil trigger, signified by his immunity bubble while transforming. On top of that, he became capable of performing two super-powered versions of Judgment Cut, where he would disappear from the field and heal for the entire duration of the moves as well. Flying around with Air Raid was no longer an option because Virgil had a guaranteed way to swap me out of the sky, so I needed a better way to combat his DT. By hitting Devil Triggered Virgil with three runes of DTE and then causing him to flinch with a Vortex, he was instantly knocked out of DTE. I still had to bide my time for an opening to do it, and sometimes I didn't have the necessary DT to manage it, but it was by far the best option for mitigating his healing. While I had figured out that aspect of the fight, I still needed to settle the matter of damage. Since I needed a fair amount of my DT to knock him out of his, DTE wasn't super viable as a damage option. And when taking his final phase into account, only guarding attacks that I was comfortable with was nowhere near enough damage to defeat him. I had to risk it all and put everything on the line for every single attack. I learned to perfect guard everything Virgil could do, even down to the slightest speed change when he would enter DT mid-combo. One wrong move, a single poorly executed block at a bad time, and it was over. But I persevered. I pushed Virgil into his final phase, and despite his grandiose attacks and unpreventable healing, I actually found it to be the easiest part of the fight, because along with the intimidating assaults came predictability. Helmbreaker always came in sets of five. After Judgment Cut chains, he would stinger. And anytime he did an ultimate Judgment Cut move or his special DT, he would follow it up by standing still for long enough to taunt and hit him with DTE or any Royal Guard gauge that I had managed to stock up. I was up to the task of taking Virgil down. I took all of the trials, all of the struggles, every single defeat and triumph along the way, and packed all of those feelings into one final release. It was done. There's a link to the full unedited fight in the description, and here are a few words from past Lucid just after winning. Ah! Oh. oh. Phase three is easy. It's the easiest phase. It's getting there that's hard. Oh, that sweet relief. It's oak over. It, I definitely got hit a lot, so it wasn't one hit KO, but with Virgil, it feels like if he hits you once, it's over. <laughs> oh, I got a really good pattern there at the end, too. I, obviously, you know, good play as well. But... Devil May Cry 3. No weapons. On Dante Must Die difficulty has been completed.